um, all right, so today we're up to the last topic of this subject. So we're talking about deployment and maintaining server images. But before we start the topic, let's actually just remind ourselves, just in case you forgot, that uh, the Fury test is next lesson. Okay, the Fury test is next lesson. There's a sample Fury test here for you to have a go. It uh, gives you an example of some of the question, types of questions you might be getting. It's from a small test bank. So you can do it many times and you might get some different questions. And trust me, some of these questions will end up in the final Fury test. So it's always good to have a go at these ones. So they, it will be a reward for people who are practicing, okay? But got to tell you that obviously the final Fury test comes from a much larger test bank than this one. And so therefore, uh, therefore you'll have plenty of questions that, uh, that are not in the sample Fury test. Um, but don't forget when I when we spoke about this right at the start of the term and semester, we said that this test was based on a the theory out of a book. So if you can't remember where the book was, that's part of the L Drive RTS Cert 4 for AWS, and here it is. Okay, I know this is a Server 2012 book, but essentially the topics we've been covering are the same. Okay, the theory is the same. The practical some differences, but mainly the same anyway, okay? So basically, if I open this up, this has various chapters, and obviously, just because they don't line up exactly with our, with our, the way we've covered it, doesn't mean it doesn't contain the information. So obviously, it talks about deploying, uh, deploying and ma managing server images as, a, as a chapter one, but we're doing it as, as the last topic. And that's not necessarily, uh, Anything is just how I've designed the topics to fit in with what we want to do and as far as the assignment goes. So you might have noticed that we sort of been doing something in the class and then we're sort of implementing that in the assignment pretty much the week afterwards. So obviously you may have to look around, for example, DNS, we did it in one topic, but there's two chapter here. So you might have to go look around and find the information. So the PowerPoints are really summarized and obviously the worksheets help you learn the practical, which again, the practical can, information you learn from the practical can be in the test as well. Okay, so for example, if we're talking about sysprep, uh, maybe that's not even in one of these chapters, but because we've actually used it in our practicals and assignments so much, I expect you to know, don't I? Okay, I expect you to know what is sysprep, what it does, and why we need to have, use sysprep in our clones. Okay, so just be aware that just because you see a question that may be not exactly as it written in, is in the, in the PowerPoint doesn't mean it's not part of the course. It's part of the course because it's part of that uh, textbook and the PowerPoints are mere summarization of what's in the te textbook. So let's get started. So very short topic today. So it's the last topic. And to be honest, um, really, uh, if we're talking about just this subject, not in real life and getting a job and all that kind of stuff, this topic just for this subject is probably one of the least important ones and that's why we put it at the last bit because it's really the practical element of it goes towards your merit section of your assignment okay one of the merit sections so really that's really for the people who finished and completed their assignment at this point in time okay if you haven't finished or completed your assignment at this point in time i wouldn't worry about trying to do the merit okay because you probably uh trying to get hard pressed to get it done by the end of next week as we spoke about. So really, as far as we're concerned, for most people, this is really just a fury, a bit of fury that go, will go, will come up, crop up with a few questions in the fury test. So yeah, so what? So if I had to rate this topic, it's probably not as important in our assessments as some of the other topics. So what I want you to do after we finish this theory is maybe study up for the theory test or work on your assignment or both. But if you want to prioritize anything, prioritize probably this topic as one of the last ones. All right, let's get started. So today we're going to look at deploying and maintaining server images. What, what does that actually mean? So basically it means how can we actually deploy a installation of various operating systems, Windows operating systems obviously, whether that be a workstation image or a server image 
to a computer that's on the network. So you might notice that we've got all these computers in front of us. Okay? They all have the same operating system, the same apps, and the same stuff. So how do they do that easily? Obviously, someone could just be sitting there and manually installing it like a thousand times. But that's probably not the most uh, efficient way of using someone's time, okay? So how do we deploy all of these computers in an easy, manageable way? So, uh, so this topic is going to talk about the Windows Deployment Services, or WDS, and basically how we can actually create what's called images that's stored on a network, and how we can actually boot up those computers which are on the same network, get an IP address, and then download a sort of a boot disk initially, then start the installation from the files which are stored on the network. So remote deployment, okay? So well, I think we spoke about this in just installation of our server in the previous subject, but obviously this is where we give it a go. So today's over, uh, session, we'll, we'll overview the Windows deployment services. We'll talk about managing images and we'll actually in our practical implement deployment with Windows Deployment Services and obviously using the Windows Deployment Services. So what is Windows Deployment Services? It's a server role that is provided with Windows Server 2012. And obviously uh, with, uh, the Windows Deployment Services enables you to perform network-based installations and simplifies the deployment process, okay? So like I said, we don't have to manually sit in front of every computer we wanna deploy and and actually we'll, uh, manually install everything and configure everything we can use existing technology such as uh, windows pe so the windows pre-installation environment uh, we use the dot wim which are windows image files and dot vhd vhdx files which we know as virtual hard disk files for your hyper-v firstly and secondly even for your physical servers <clears throat> and the windows base deployment. So Windows Deployment Service components, so we need a few components as you can imagine. So we need a transport server, so a multicast engine, and obviously this will include Windows PowerShell commands for managing the sessions. Uh, but with the deployment server, we need a PXE server. So if you don't know what PXE or PIXE server is, it's a pre-execution pre environment server. What does that mean? It means that your computers obviously normally boot from the hard drive. Okay, that's pretty normal. Boot from the hard drive, boot from USB sticks, uh, boot from a DVD or a, uh, optical drive. That's pretty regular stuff. But all of your computers in front of you will have a network card. Pretty much all network cards these days have a Pixie boot capability. What does that mean? That means instead of booting from a local media, which is in uh, either the internal hard drive, or external hard drive, USB stick, or optical media, it can actually boot from the network. Okay? Boot from the network. So the Pixie allows our computer to actually query, do a broadcast, obviously, get an IP address. But part of getting this IP address, the DHCP server will give us what's called the boot server, or the next server, or it's got a couple of different names. Okay? And once it actually gives us this IP address, of, obviously we get an IP address, and we also get a, um, a Pixie server address, we actually download a boot image. Just like you might have a boot CD-ROM or boot USB stick, uh, which actually has the boot, a bootable elements on it, we can actually download from the network a boot image. And then from that boot image, obviously where we're getting this from, we're getting it from a TFTP server, a Trivial File Transport server, and it's, uh, these images could be uh, stored, there could be many images, but it could be stored in a uh, image store. And when we boot up, we actually enter this uh, Windows pre-installation environment, okay, which gives us, sometimes it gives us some basic graphical user interface, sometimes it gives us just a command line. But, but then, with the Windows deployment services, it will, if it's all automated, it actually triggers a installation from a network share. Okay, so we all know what network shares are. So we, instead of having our CD or DVD or ISO image on a local media, they're stored somewhere on the network. Okay, and then we download that and we start the installation. And obviously during the installation, instead of actually making manual choices 
as in we tick this option, we select that setting, and we make these configurations. We are going to be using a <coughs> answer file that actually answers all these uh, uh, requirements during installation, and it's going to supply the right settings, right options, and so forth. So let's consider this scenario. So consider the following scenario. In a small network consisting of a single server and around 25 Windows XP computers, and you want to expedite the upgrade process of a, of a client uh, to Windows 8. Okay, so basically you got Windows XP, you want to go to Windows 8. Okay. Uh, well, if you got 25 computers, you could almost do it manually, couldn't you? And worst case scenario is you do it manually. And but 25 computers if I took you know if I took an hour or two just to install every computer configure the right settings and so forth and there's 25 of them that's that's 50 hours isn't it what about the impact to the people who are using the computer okay so basically even in a small environment like that with a single server and 25 computers it may not be that easy just to do a simple uh, just do an upgrade or use a fresh installation of Windows 8 in this case, okay, or Windows 10 or whatever version of, of it is. What about another situation? What about a medium sized organization wants to deploy multiple servers into a branch office that are geographically dispersed and it would be time consuming and expensive to send an experienced IT staff to that location to de deploy the server? So let's say we've got this Adelaide campus, but we just, yeah, just like. Um, just like uh, we've got lots of TAFE campuses, let's say we've got a new TAFE campus opening up, you know, in uh, let, let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's say we've got a new campus opening up in yeah, you know, what's a really really uh, distant place in South Australia, somewhere we're really remote. All right, uh, let's just say is sorry. Claire? Yeah, we'll probably got one in Claire, but let's say Claire, <laughs> okay? Okay, let's say Claire. We, let's say, the, how, how many hours drive is that? Three hours? Oh, okay, that's not even far enough. <laughs> let's just say we're like in the middle of... Uh, Cooper Pedy. Okay, that's a good one. All right, that's how many hours drive is that? 11 hours drive, yeah. Let's say that there's 11 hours drive or a plane ticket, okay? You got experienced technician here at LED, and we've just got some... As uh, workers there at this branch office, not really any IT support. We provide the IT support through phone and from remote desktop. Okay, that's what we do because it's such a small office. Okay, most of the time that's fine. But now they would need a server. They need a new server there because uh, we just talked about DFS a couple of sessions ago. And now we want to have our files over there. We want to deploy a DFS server over there. Okay, no one there. So we've only got the yeah reception lady, the the the, the lecturer in fashion, and the lecturer in uh, what's it woodwork. They don't really know much about IT. Okay, we've got a couple of other people working on the campus, but not much uh, IT knowledge. Okay, they can use a basic computer for what they need to yeah take role and do all that kind of stuff. But they, you can't expect them to go install a server and then configure DFS. So, I mean, some of you guys are having lots of trouble configuring DFS and you guys are supposed to be IT literate, aren't you? So, let's say that was the situation. So, how about I do this? How about I actually create an automated installation and put it on a bootable C uh, DVD? Okay. Oh. So, I actually use my WDS, create a bootable installation. Uh, what's a bitable DVD with that automated installation script? I send that whole because obviously it's a geographically far distance, and I don't want to transfer all, all this installation over network, the WAN link. So I'm, instead of doing that, I'm going to put it on a DVD. I'm going to mail it to Kubernetes. I know that there's this guy who works down there. I've talked to him, but I know he's not really great with computers, but he can use a basic computer. He can turn it on. He can put a DVD in, couldn't he? So I actually instruct him over the phone, take the DVD, put it in the tray, close the tray, turn on the computer, make sure it's booting from the DVD, and now you go away. Okay, now you just leave it. And basically what we can do is because we can automate installation, that guy can just turn on the server with the DVD in, and now the server is going to be deployed. And what's even better is we can actually then configure DFS, even if that means I remote desktop it and finish the 
configuration myself. The operating system is at least done, but we can actually do a lot more than just install the operating system as well. Okay. <clears throat> so how to use Windows deployment services. So let's have a look at this one. The Datum Corporation IT staff is about to deploy Windows Server 2012 to various branch offices. The following information has been provided by the IT staff to management. The configuration of uh, various branch office servers is expected to be fairly consistent. There's no requirement for upgrade settings from existing servers as these are new branch offices and there, there's no current IT infrastructure in place. Automation of the deployment process is important as there's many servers to deploy. So again, similar to what we just talked about. Okay, this is not an upgrade, this is a fresh deployment because these are new sites. Okay, so you don't have to worry about keeping the existing data. Uh, it's going to be generic. Okay, is it saying that the various branch offices is expected to be fairly consistent? So which means it's the same. Okay, what I'm going to do in this branch office and that branch office and that branch office is the same. Let's say I'm putting a DFS server in all of them or putting a domain controller in all of them or putting a uh, wherever server, which is all the same. Okay. <clears throat> So there's a lot of servers to deploy. So I don't want to be like, let's say instead of one place, Kubernetes, we've got, you know, like a Port Lincoln. There's another one in like, a, what's it, Adrosan, another one in like a Berry. So we've got all these sites. Okay, this IT, uh, we've got uh, our small number of IT stuff. Yeah, okay? maybe can't leave the campus or the main campus for extended times like that. And it's expensive to send someone physically over there, isn't it? So instead of doing that, we again, do what we just spoke about, create an automated installation that has all the answer files for the different requirements, put on a DVD that's bootable and send it over there and instruct someone that's local who's actually can turn on a computer with the DVD in there. <clears throat> Here's another uh, scenario. A, da uh, a Datum corporation wants to deploy several dozen new servers in their head office. Windows Server 2012 will be installed on these servers. The following is their requirement. The configuration of the various servers ex uh, is expected to vary slightly, so very fairly similar again. Uh, so the key thing is when we're talking about these things, these deployments, if they're all, so, if they're all very different, then it, 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 this automation doesn't work properly, does it? But if they're very similar, then it's a lot easier, okay? So that's one of the key things you have to watch out for. There are two basic server configurations. There's a full GUI and a server core. Okay, so there's two options. Managing network traffic is critical as the new uh, network is near capacity. So again, we have to deploy it now inside the head office, so we're there. But we don't have to necessarily install these servers um, exactly at the, at the, what's it, at the time, uh, at the business hours. Okay, so let's say we're, we're here from nine to five, like most people. But we can do the installation after hours, couldn't we? We don't physically have to be here as the IT staff. Because it's automated, because of that, the actual pixie booting that we talked about before, because of the idea that you can have what's called wake on LAN. Have you heard of that, wake on LAN? So basically all these computers are off, but they're plugged in. They've got power, they just turn off. They got the network card, which is plugged into their, <clears throat> to the switch. And basically wake on LAN means if the network card is capable and is enabled, I can set, uh, send a wake on LAN packet that actually wakes them up, turns them on, okay? In fact, I have an app on my phone that allows me to send a wake on LAN packet to wherever MAC address I want. So therefore I can actually from here at TAFE, I can use my VPN, which we've been talking about, to dial up my home router and then use my wake on LAN packet to turn on my uh, NAS, and then use my web management to actually do something on my NAS at home. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. Putting all those things together allows you to do this from anywhere, doesn't it? So basically, if we've got this work on LAN, we've got Pixie Boot, we've got these WDS deployment <coughs> services, and we've got PowerShell sort of script knowledge, why couldn't we just put it, create a basic script that sends a work on LAN packet to, to these specific computers that we know the MAC address of and tell them to actually boot from the network and get and we configure the images that they're meant to be deploying and we put it use Windows scheduler and we schedule it for 2 a.m. Okay, why couldn't we do that? 
So we could potentially, couldn't we? Okay, when we walk in in the morning, the servers are finished, the basic installation, if you like, and I just go off and finish it off. Okay. <clears throat> so let's actually start looking at what the details are. So let's have a look. The role of the images in Windows Deployment Services. So there is uh, there's three types of images in WDS which are used uh, as boot or installation images. So there's some images which are used for uh, yeah, booting. Remember how we talked about Pixie booting? They download an image which has the bootable information. So that contains, <clears throat> and obviously that could be a WIMAGE, VXD, a VHD or a VHDX file. Here's a WMI, uh, WM, WIM, sorry, WIM file. And we don't need you to know exactly the details of what's in here, but just to have a basic concept, uh, we've got a header, we've got some file resources, metadata, uh, XML data. Uh, so you'll realize that when we create these answer files, uh, XML is actually a really important uh, file, okay, type of file that we use. <clears throat> we also use this Windows Assessment and Deployment Kit, or WAK, uh, ADK, okay, WADK. So this is a Windows Assessment and Deployment Kit. It basically helps us create these answer files or automated installations or images. So Windows uh, System Image Manager or Windows Sim, we need uh, those, uh, that as well. There's obviously that allows us to manage the images that we spoke about just before, the different types of images. We need a Windows PE, pre-installation environment. Uh, we use a user state migration tool and we deploy image servicing and, and management with the DISM. So basically, just, just for the Fury test, make sure you know some of these acronyms like DISM, yeah, the WIM, Windows PE, and yeah, w <laughs> VHD, or I'm sure you know the VHD, VHDX from previous subjects, but just know what they are. Not this, you don't even need to know exactly what they do, but uh, just an overview, okay? So there's different types of images as well. There's what's called a fin image, okay, which contains only the operating system and possibly a few agents such as the configuration manager uh, 2012 agent. <clears throat> and there's also a FIC, a FIC image, which contains every application required by the end user. So what does that mean? Basically, if this one contains only an operating system plus a little... Uh, a few agents, that means what we're going to get is just operating system installed plus a few utilities on there. A thick image is just like how we get these computers. Okay, you notice that when we get these computers, we actually remember when we had to re image that computer right at the back? Remember? Uh, we and When he finished, at the end of the day, we logged in and we had VMware Workstation, we had Office, and we had all those different programs we meant to have. So that's like a thick image because that includes. Uh, all the applications as part of that image okay so have you ever heard of the term imaging okay it's not new okay oh, for example if you had a Norton ghost if you had a Norton ghost you had or could be semantic ghosts I don't know what happened there it's companies bought companies and so forth that we used to use that all the time it's before we had virtualization we used to have to put a new operating system on these computers all the time if we're teaching server, we need to put the server operating system on these computers. If we're teaching something else, we put that image on there. So it's a bit like an image is just like an ISO is a capture of a DVD image, isn't it? Of the files, of exactly how the disk looks bit for bit. Okay? A image is how a hard drive is bit for bit. Okay? So when we take an image that's stored on a server and we put it onto this computer it's almost like writing it just like that on the computer but the beauty of this instead of the old Norton ghost semantic ghost type imaging is that that was a specific capture of a specific installation what does that mean that means if we put on the same hardware no problems if we put on a slightly different hardware with different drivers and stuff like that you get all sorts of problems Whereas this is a deployment rather than imaging. Even though we start off with this image, 
uh, we are actually installing the operating system onto the new hardware, wherever that hardware may be. And obviously, if it's part of the hardware compatibility list, it will have little drivers and will go on for wherever the drivers they are. They might be 10 different computers with different hardware, but because they're all part of the hardware compatibility the, uh, list, the, the Windows has the built-in drivers. Or if we have something that has a specific driver that we don't have, we can actually slipstream that driver into our deployment as well. Okay. There's also a hybrid image which contains some of the application required by most users. So basically, creating an install image. The process of creating an install image can be uh, summarized as follows. Create a capture image. So obviously, example computer. Okay. Um, so install win uh, so so install a win install Windows onto a, onto a reference computer, customize the settings on the reference computer, and then generalize the reference computer. What, what does that mean? What, what does it mean when we say generalize? Where do you hear that from? Sysprep, right? Right? Yeah, that's right. That's what do you think the Sysprep is really there for? We use it for cloning, but it's really used for this. Yeah, yeah, this purpose. Of multiple deployments, physical deployments, rather than cloning, really. Okay, so was when Sysprep was invented uh, in the first place, it's not just for cloning. It was, cloning wasn't even part of the idea. It was for deployments, e easy deployment of multiple computers. Because guess what? If we use imaging, especially with Norton Ghost and all that kind of stuff that we talked about, they're exactly going to be clones, physical clones, rather than virtual machine clones. So we generalize the reference computer, we capture the reference image. It's a bit like what we've been doing in the virtual machine, capturing as a snapshot. Then we cloned it, didn't we? So in this case, instead of actually talking about clones in the virtual machine, we're creating a reference computer, Golden Master, and then we're customizing the settings, and then we're capturing the computer after it's been generalized, and then afterwards it's a bit like the cloning ID, but it's a physical machine we're deploying through the network and rather than in a virtualized environment. Okay, guys? So, so a lot of the things are sort of can be transferable. DISM can be used to manage and maintain the images, including up, uh, applying update drivers, language packs. So the, one of the problems with having an image is that what happens if we have service packs, patches, Every month we get like uh, updates from Microsoft, don't we? So does that mean when we actually deploy this new is a uh, new computer, it's going to have to spend another six hours updating it to the latest updates? Um, we can use DISM to add, remove, uh, enumer or enumerate packages and drivers. So basically, adding packages like uh, Windows features or programs and enumerate means just list okay list yeah it's almost like inventory of what you've got on there we can enable or disable windows features we can apply uh, changes based on offline servicing section of the unattended answer file so the unattended answer file is that file that answers all the questions during installation that we asked by the installation process but instead of being there and answering them by choosing the settings on screen it's actually supplying the answers in the answer file. Okay. Uh, it allows us to configure the locale settings, so the location settings, so we're in Adelaide, time zone, all that kind of stuff, currency, all that kind of stuff. So we can upgrade an image to a different edition of Windows as well. So that DISM allows us to do that. So understanding Windows deployment service components. So Windows service uh, deployment service prerequisites include. So Active Directory Domain Services, okay? So if you want to use WDS, you have to have an Active Directory Domain. Well, you need a DHCP server, well, because they need to boot from the network, don't they? Remember what we said? In order to boot from the network, they need to use that Pixie boot, and the Pixie boot will get an IP address from the DHCP server. Because it's a Pixie boot, there's no setting where you go inside and tell it to use the static uh, IP addresses and so forth. And the other thing is that DHCP is going to do a little bit more than just give it an IP address. It's going to tell it who its yeah, TFTP server is. So, okay, the, the server that includes the bootable image. Okay, where to go to actually get that bootable information. 
We need DNS, obviously, for name resolution, but we all know that no DNS, no Active Directory in the first place, don't we? So how many times have we said that? How many times have you had a problem joining to a domain or doing something in a domain and then you realize, hey, I didn't specify the DNS properly? Okay, remember that RODC, the Elizabeth site? You couldn't even join us as a domain because maybe you just forgot that the only DNS server we had was at the Adelaide site. Because you assumed, hey, the RODC is a DNS, why can't we just use it? Because you can't, because it's not a DNS at that point in time. Okay? We need NTFS volume. So obviously, where do we store these images and so forth? It has to be on an NTFS volume. Okay? And we use the Windows Automated Deployment Kit Toolkit to create these answer files for automated deployments. Install and configure Windows Deployment Services by installing the Windows uh, Deployment Services server role. So again, it's a server role. We know how to do that. We add the server role. Uh, we install the Windows Deployment Server or the Transport Port Server role. So that Transport Server role is playing that role of that TFTP server, which actually sends the traffic, sends the information like the boot images across the network to the uh, Pixie Boots computers. We perform post installation configuration of Windows deployment services by specifying the image store location, configuring the DHCP server options if required, and configuring the Pixie server configuration. Uh, to service client computers with Windows deployment services, you must configure the boot settings, configure the install settings, configure the transmission settings, and configure the drivers. Okay, so the worksheet it will walk you through doing a lot of these things. It's not going to do every scenario, obviously, but what it's going to do, it's going to show you how to install a operating system, create an answer file through the network. Okay, and when it does this, it actually will, uh, hopefully at the end of it, your, uh, operating, your client operating system is installed and it will be automatically generalized like we talked about and it will automatically be joined to the domain straight away so some common administration tasks there are so, several administration tasks and tools that the windows deployment services you need so you, one of the tasks include configuring dhcp server so dhcp server needs to give out ip addresses scope options like dns gateway all those regular stuff but more options remember we talked about pixie boot we need to specify the pixie server okay uh, or the boot server uh, we need to create the service images, manage the boot menu, uh, pre-stage client computers. What does pre-stage mean? It basically means, what if the network is slow? That means your installation is going to be slow, isn't it? Because it's going to download all of the requirements over the network to this computer and use it as it needs it during installation. Okay, we know that like a DVD is 4.5 gigs and probably the Windows Server DVD or the Windows 10 is pretty much full, isn't it? So if it has to transfer that much information data during the installation, that installation is going to be really slow if your network is slow. Okay, so pre-staging means, hey, how about let's not even do that. Let's not transfer as we need it during installation. Pre-stage means how about we actually get the files onto that computer first okay before we even start the installation okay and obviously one of the ways is to actually have a local source like a local dvd but still have the ability to uh, automate it okay like we talked about with the branch offices uh, we need to order uh, we, we need to automate the deployment so we create these answer files and make those decisions that we normally would make during installation in the answer files and we need to configure the transmission the server that actually uh, it supplies the files. Where is the file stored? Yeah, is it the network share that the computers need the access to in order to get the files? And some of the tools we need is the Windows Deployment Services Console, the WDS Utils.exe, the DISM exe. We all know SysPrep. There's also ImageX and the Windows Sim, which is the bitable images. And automating deployments. To automate a Windows setup process, we create a, what's called an unattended dot, uh, unattended dot XML. And this is what's called the answer file. Okay, when you go in and choose your location is Adelaide time zone plus nine and a half, 
and so forth that's all recorded in there when we go in and say that set the administrator password to password one uh, join a domain all those information again is in that XML file okay this provides all the answers we copy the file to the Windows deployment service server we'll view the properties of the appropriate installation image and enable the intended mode to, to this and select the answer file and then when a client computer boots up and gets an IP address from DHCP get a, a pixie boot uh, server it'll go to that pixie boot server get the boot image it'll boot up the right image and the, during the boot image it will actually actually then connect to the D, uh, WDS server and then start the automated installation based on what you've chosen for that computer and what operating system so you can actually with your administration of WDS we can say this computer gets the Windows 10 operating system this computer gets this other image the server 2016 uh, installation so we can actually make those uh, yeah, we can create these what's called uh, yeah these computer groups type things and allocate different images to different computer groups or even during the installation we can choose which particular image we want to install all right so that was a relatively quick one so what i want you to guys to do now is obviously if you're behind on your worksheet uh your assignment work on that but your priority should be at this stage studying up for your fury test okay once you pass your theory test like we said we've got the rest of next week to finish everything off maybe then at that point start looking at your assignment or your worksheets